Good day, everyone who are here with me, all the women leaders here, and to everyone who is joining us uh, via Facebook, anywhere, any part of the world. So I decided not to figure out the good day, good evening. So hopefully everybody is having a good day. So welcome to the streaming of uh, um, Women Leadership Principles ninth episode. So I have the opportunity to guide and facilitate the discussion. Uh, so thank you, Desiree. So if you're joining us for the first time or you're a returning attendee, all of you are welcome. Uh, the leaders who have assembled here and uh, those of the leaders who cannot join us today, who convey their best wishes to us, uh, we all belong to an organization called um, uh, NAWRB's uh, Diversity and Inclusion Leadership Council, founded and uh, being led by Desiree Patino, um, Patino, whom you see, uh, see on the call, on the meeting. We all come from different backgrounds and hold different leadership roles. At the same time, we are all united in our passion to give back to the community. And so two years ago, we came together collectively, uh, drew upon our experiences and formulated these 10 leadership principles. And Desiree had this brilliant idea of uh, bringing us together every month and uh, expound on them, share our experiences, share our insights, because ultimately these principles are what we felt had have, have guided us throughout our journey. And these principles are so relatable that they can guide anyone who is coming up the ranks, uh, who are looking at leadership positions. So now about us, a little about us. Uh, so Desiree is the founder uh, of NAWRB and this council, she's the CEO. Uh, so the brain, uh, her brainchild is this organization. And uh, we have Kelly uh, 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 from formerly, former, formerly at UPS held various leadership positions. And now she's a firepower behind um, in the serving as the serving as a member of the board of marine uh, applied research and exploration so uh, leading us leading the way for providing data for intelligent exploration if space we are looking at space as the next frontier ocean is yet another uh, rich with uh, so much to explore so uh, thank you uh, kelly for uh, um, leading the entire humanity in that direction we have teresa palacio smith and uh, uh, Teresa is very, she has uh, gone through the ranks of leader in real estate. Now she's a chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer at, for Home Services of America. She describes herself, and I looked it up, she describes herself as a Latina with Yankee rebel attitude, and I loved it. And uh, one of her uh, amazing sayings is that she talks about how we all should invest in CD, CD, that provides the most greatest return, which is cultural diversity. I really found that uh, very memorable, uh, Teresa. Not was not least, but she's a, a latest addition to our uh, NDILC council, Tasha, Tasha Leniger. She's the chief uh, um, human resources officer at uh, Dialpad. I'm still getting to know Tasha, so I do not have uh, tidbits to offer about Tasha. So hopefully during this conversation, Tasha will uh, let, let us into her world. So um, we are today about NDLC, just a little bit for those of you joining for the first time. This is dedicated to raising the number of women leaders and growing women's employment and, and empowerment in all uh, levels uh, in various industries. So thank you fellow uh, council members for sharing this time with us today. And our topic is prepare for the future. So typically we have done that by going round uh, uh, in a round robin fashion, uh, sharing our experiences. I thought today we'll stir it up a bit. <laughs> I'm known for doing that. So how about we do this? Um, I'm going to say, uh, so we know, we all have heard the future, future belongs to those, those of us who are prepared. Luck favors the one who is best prepared. Uh, we live it in our personal lives, in our professional lives, in our communities, changes the way of life. Either the change that we initiate, like moving, like me, moving to an entirely different country as a young woman on the, uh, you know, on the verge of getting her uh, PhD, or sometimes change comes upon us unexpectedly like the pandemic. Uh, so if you are only looking to the past or present, uh, we are certain to miss the future. So this topic is so apt so timely and resonant of the uh, the new world normal we are living in. So I'm going to ask my fellow uh, 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 council members here just to 
without thinking this is a lightning round when we talk about when we say prepare for the future what few things come to your mind we will take that all up and then we will expand on them so in no particular order so it's a rapid fire don't overthink it teresa oh, you hit me first huh? <laughs> <laughs> i told oh. you i was going to stir it up <laughs> you know what if for me preparing for the future means you know several things so let's look at it from a uh, growth perspective work wise related so you know the economy what's happening we've got you know, um, the uh, cyclical real estate market, which has been going up, 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 you know, for the last several years. And so looking at the future, what does that look like? What does it look like from a perspective of agents, you know, agents that we kind of work with, right? The consumer as well, you know, things are st starting to slow down. It's been a very, very strong seller's market for very, uh, quite for a couple of years. And now we're seeing it going back to what I call normal. You're starting to see a little bit of time um, differentials within uh, listings versus those, you know, 10 to 15 uh, bid offers. Uh, yesterday, I actually in Atlanta, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. I saw for the first time a reduced price listing, right? And that was surprising to me because you don't see price reductions quite as often in the past as you have, you know, uh, those a multiple, you know, higher than above a list price. So all that thought, the Teresa, we are going to come back to you. I want you to expand on the growth, but that's just fabulous way to start off. When you think about prepare for the future, it is about growth, growth personally, professionally. Growth. Tasha, then we are going to come back. Tasha, uh, we'll go around, you know, the first thoughts that come to our mind in terms of what, what impacts us the most. Tasha, you next. Yeah. So, um, First thing that came to my mind is how do I set myself up sort of at the beginning of the week, beginning of the month, beginning of the quarter, beginning of the year. And when I was more junior in my career, I spent most of my time fighting fires, resolving like in moment conflicts and issues. And I actually just interestingly yesterday was um, working with sort of a, a manager training um, potential coach that we're going to hire to bring into our company and work with our managers on improving their leadership skills. And one of the things that he said to me that was really interesting was that in general, leaders, managers um, spend less than 30%, usually between 10 and 30% planning for the future, thinking strategically, carving out time in their day, in their weeks, in their months to think about how they want to take their team from point A to point B. In fact, most of the time, 90% of the time, they're fighting in moment fires like I've been doing my whole career, right? Right. Um, they said that the highest they've done a study, the highest performing teams actually flipped that completely. And almost the leaders spend almost 70% of their time thinking about how to get their teammates from point A to point B. So, um, I don't do this perfectly, but I just thought I would share that. That's just like a little nugget of something that I'm trying to flip the, sw flip the switch on. So in fact, to do that, I was just sharing before we all got on this morning, I woke up really early, mainly because I couldn't really sleep. But also I was like, you know what, I'm instead of like complaining about this, my insomnia, I'm going to get up. And I did just that a ton of planning. I was like, okay, I feel so much better about this next month because I was able to take a couple hours to do that. So anyway, just a little that's nugget from my perspective last, last week and kind of what's been on my mind as it relates to perfect. this. When we think about preparing for the future, it is all about growth. And in order to grow, we need to plan. Desiree, what comes to your mind? Exactly what Tasha just said in a, in a different scope is, is that I was spending so much time trying to make sure that I got the details of certain things done and not looking at the macro and not looking at the bigger picture and what we could do. Because if you think about what's going on in the world, so many things are changing so fast. And so to prepare for the future, you have to look at the bigger picture and then micro it down. And so now I make sure that I spend, you know, allocate time every single week of having at least a couple hours. What is my goals going to be this week that I'm going to get done? But most importantly, what is my goal going to be for a year or two years or three years? Because if we look at what's just going to happen for the next day task, then where are we going to go? And we're not going to be in the moment for how, you know, we're not 20 anymore. I hate to say it guys, you know, <laughs> so how do we prepare to make sure that the evolution of where we live, how we live, why we live and how we work with technology, with, you know, the economics that are going on and also with the earth itself, 
I look at that and I say, okay, how do we project and how do I bring it back? And that to me is a bigger scale. And, and everyone talks about the 50, you know, 50 a thousand foot level. What about space and down? And that's kind of where I'm looking at. Very good. Kelly? I think of like four words. I think of education, experience, flexibility, and resilience. Because I think you've got to be educated and you got to continue to educate yourself and learn. You've got to get experiences that, that give you the context for that education. You've got to be flexible because things are changing so fast. And then you better be resilient or you're just not going to make it. So I, I always, those four words kind of do it for me. That's the things that I would look at to prepare for the future. We'll spend time uh, teasing apart and uh, going you know, uh, around the room in terms of how we are preparing specifically for that. So for me, already things are jumping at, right? You prepare for the future for growth and you need to plan, plan at a very uh, detailed level so that you can have the uh, confidence to execute them, making sure they get done. And Desiree talked about the big picture, not, not only details. And Kelly, you laid out our how to get there, education, resilience, and so on. So for me, uh, since I work in the healthcare industry, increasingly more and more about aging, one thing that is borne upon me is that uh, in order to prepare for the future is having a well-lived present. You know, more and more I think about it in health-wise, in uh, professional lives, in personal lives. How do we make the most of today? Uh, so that we are poised to, uh, to be ready to tackle on any challenge that comes in the future. So uh, I thought now uh, we see these interconnections coming together, right? Having a well-lived future in order to prepare for the growth. And in order to succeed, we need to have the planning at the granular as well as big level and all the ways in which. Uh... So Kelly, why don't you, you know, we can take each one of this and uh, reflect on us. Uh, that will help our attendees. Uh, uh, how we prepared ourselves. And there were challenges along the way. Uh, all of us got here where we are um, uh, through hard fought, <laughs> uh, hard fought successes. So right. how did we prepare? Uh, you know, in our vision board, we had this, I, I, you know, we all had some vision of ourselves in the future. And how did we prepare ourselves for that? Yeah. For this day? You, you know, I, I think, um, as you mentioned, Chitri, you know, these, all the, the planning and growth, they're, they're so important. And I think it kind of starts with that, that love of learning, right? And that's why I mentioned education first, because education comes in a lot of different ways. I'm not just talking about school learning, although that's an important piece, but I'm also talking about the life's experiences, right? That you go through, um, the, the cultural diversity you learn from moving and relocating and travel. I mean, I think you learn so much from all of those experiences. And if you don't get out and get the certifications or the degrees or whatever it is for whatever it is you want to work at, you can't even get in the door these days. So it's critical that whatever it is you love, whatever that is, get someone, either you know a mentor of some type or go to a school or do whatever it takes to get the, the, uh, the teaching that you need to really excel in it. Because you have to be able to take feedback from other people to get better. And that education piece is critical. So again, whether that's a BA or an MBA or whether that's a trade school or whether that's you know learning as an apprentice in some type of vocation, all of those are good. I, I just think that you've got to continually keep learning. You can't think that you've gotten there. You've got to keep learning. And that's how you use experiences and everything else to, uh, to help open your mind to other ideas. And I think that's where you can really start to plan well, as Desiree and Tasha talked about, and then you can start to grow, like Teresa said. I mean, you, you almost can't do that unless you get that learning embedded in your system. I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn from this person or that school or this trade school or whatever the case may be. And uh, keep that open mind to learning. Yeah, lifelong learning. Teresa, you set us off with a great goal of growth. And I see growth, resilience, all are, it's all about preparing for the future. Give us an example. Tell us, you know, how you have seen yourself grow to be where you are. Well, first of all, Kelly, I couldn't agree with you more about the education piece. And I and a lot of times people struggle with that because either they were not good uh, in school, right? Uh, it wasn't something that they achieved in. So you got to remember that. 
So, but I can tell you right now that one of the biggest things that we have today as we prepare to, for the future is a lot of access via computers. You know, you've got YouTube. I mean, I want to tell you right now, I learned so much about every little thing, like, you know, even how to prepare, you know, like, how do I fix my plumbing? Like things that you, you, you would never have thought you could do yourself. You can do on YouTube now, right? And so you can learn so much. You can teach others as well, Kelly, which I think you and teacher, I mean, great teachers, right? Others as well uh, to prepare as well, you know, for different things. But as I look at growth and what has prepared me from a perspective is wealth creation. I think it's really important for all of us to start to think about you know, and this is something that minorities, and I'm going to say his, Hispanics, we're not very good at. We're not very good about saving money um, as far as, you know, putting it in 401k or putting it in uh, in investments, right? We, we don't always do that. And I think that's really critical so that we can continue to expand because it's all about you know, when influence and influence is about making sure that you have enough save and teacher, you know, this, as we look at retiring, right, as we look at the cost of nursing and the cost of aftercare of all these services after the fact that are not covered, uh, that's something that you have to consider and the legacy that you leave for the family members behind is also a, a, an important part of that growth. So I think for me, my biggest lesson, and I didn't have this with my dad. My dad, you know, he spent every single, we were always living above our means and we were always financially in trouble. And I mean, the debt was unbelievable in my household. And that's something that when I married Mike, and because Mike and I dated in high school, we said we will never ever have credit card debt because I don't want to get those calls from creditors saying that you guys are losers because you don't pay your credit card bills. And um, we, we kept to that promise. And to this day, if we can't afford to pay for it, we just don't buy it. You know, it's just one of those things. And that's what I think it's creating wealth, making sure that you invest in real estate, but also diversify your portfolio as well. Hey, can I just throw a comment in on that? I mean, Teresa, I couldn't agree with you more. Financial education is sorely missing out of our out of our schools, and I found at UPS um, a lot of our our compensation was deferred compensation packages and things like that. Well, the men were really good at sharing that information and talking about financial pieces, and and really ensuring that people were getting set up correctly. The women never wanted to talk about it, so I made it my goal right to share and talk about. What do you do with deferred compensation? How, what stocks do you invest in? How do you develop a portfolio? All of that. And it's just sorely missing from every, every type of education system that we have, but specifically for minorities and females. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yep. And that's what I think really is so critical for all of you out there to understand and start to practice. And again, reach out to us and say, hey, how, what do I do? Or how do I get involved? Or where do I start? 401k. People, number one, invest in that. Put the maximum amount you can. That's where you start. So anyway, just, you know, and then real estate, of course. <laughs> we, we, I sell, you know, that's the business I'm in. So investing in real estate in your own home, that's another part of it. One key aspect of preparing for the future is the financial solvency, not just solvency, financial wealth accumulation, which is what, yeah, and uh, that do that dovetails with uh, lifelong learning. I think uh, preparing for the future is also not being uh, uh, scared and worried about the technology. Technology is bringing down the skills needed to uh, invest wisely, uh, diversify and so on. And we have to embrace the technology. Oh, I, I don't want to do that. I think women with advanced skills or women with no fear of technology has another quiver, arrow in their quiver to succeed uh, in the in the in the workplace. Tasha, any thoughts to offer on that in that direction? Oh, Sorry about that. Yeah. So my my um my brain's been buzzing with different ideas. One thing I you know just sort of tactically speaking, we know to be true is that people can't plan for the future if they worry about. What, where their next meal is coming from. Um, so just maybe not a lot of the people listening to this podcast are in that situation, but 
I would bet that probably a significant percentage of the people sort of worry about the stability of their job. You know, like how am I performing in my role? If I'm performing well, what's the solvency of my company? Um, and so when you're when you're weighed down by some of those fears, those like immediate like hierarchy of fears, it's really hard to plan for the future. So one of the things that I think about um, is providing sort of psychological safety for our employees. You know, I want them always to be thinking about what they're going after and how will they become better and how I can help them do that. So to build like a reflective culture that like really embraces feedback is a key stepping stone to how we can improve performance and get and sort of pull our, our employees up, or especially our female employees have a special lens for that, right? So, um, so one of the things that, you know, just in closing on this is, you know, I, I do a couple things. And by the way, I, I'm sounding like I got all the answers. I don't, but I've recently gone through a couple of training sessions on this. And um, one of the things that I think is important to do is ask a few similar questions every time you have a discussion with maybe an employee or, or if you're an employee with your, with your manager, it's like, what, what's going well? What do I want to improve or fix? And do I have the tools I need to become better? Like, do I have what I need the support to become better? And so when you sort of create that reflective, you know, like that self-reflection um, on a regular basis in organizations, I think the only, like the only thing that can happen is that we improve performance and people become more forward thinking, right? Um, and, and they have a sense of sort of, control of their destiny. So um, anyway, my, that's where my brain went. Yeah, it's like a gratitude journaling people talk about increasingly. Now you're talking about self-reflective uh, journaling. Yeah. yeah. So Desiree, yeah. yeah. Can, and to get people thinking forward, I mean, Tasha, you hit on a big piece right there. People get stuck in the past and yeah. they remember labels, how they were labeled in the past. They remember all these things from the past rather than focusing on, again, that improvement in the future. And that's an important, a huge piece for all of us to continue to think about. It's not about today. So how do we move forward? How do we get better? How do we get you know, out of whatever it is we're in? And um, I, I, I agree, Tasha, whatever you can do with your work colleagues, with your management team, with your employees, all of that to get that forward looking view that's that's a big piece. Yeah, one of the things, just to close um, a thought, sorry, Chicha, on this is someone said something to me that has always stuck with me, which is the worst managers, the worst leaders always remember their employees as the point they were, the value they brought when they first hired them. And they they don't evolve the, the way they think about possibilities for the employee as they grow in their career. So I just think that that's important. Like, if you're someone listening to this and you have a manager that still sort of referred, thinks of your skill level as when you first started working for them, maybe that's not the right spot for you, you know? So um, anyway, just, just something that that's the way I sort of always think about it is like both from an employee and a manager perspective. I think it's fantastic. If you think about the, the ability, what um, uh, Kelly just brought, uh, also to amplify and Tasha is, is that our high school years are the ones we always reflect on, right? What we were like, how we were labeled when we were at high school. Oh, I'm going to go back to my, you know, 50 year reunion or whatever. And you're like, oh my gosh, you know, this is what they're going to think of me and how, how, how have I evolved? And, you know, they, they labeled me. So I think that's so powerful, which relates to Tasha, you saying how, when you first joined the company, what was that reflective of and how I gotten or evolved from that? So, um, so mine is the ask. I think as women, we never ask for the resources. We never ask whether it's for a pay gap, whether it's for you know, the ability to take time off to raise the children, whether we're always fearful of the ask of the ask. And so I feel that for us that we need to start asking and, and, and someone brought up the thing about the plumbing, you know, Teresa, you talked about, you know, oh, we could YouTube everything. And so I look at us, our computer or as our phone, which is a, a computer better than some of our laptops and desktops <laughs> as a way of a resource to find out everything and anything. So one of the things I think that's so important as a leader right now is, is that how do we deal with healthcare? How do we deal with uh, the changing of the financial aspects and how we plan for the future is, when you're in front of the experts and you're in front of that, that life uh, changing moment to be better prepared yourself to ask the questions when you have that finite time to actually hone in on, okay, did this research, I did this background work on it. 
this is what I understand. So how do we partner together with the expert to make the best outcome in healthcare, in our financial aspects, and or what we're thinking of doing in our life? Because then you're maximizing the time on a high level and not on a low level on the expert that you're in front of. Because time is the biggest commodity we all have. And that ability to maximize our strength to grow I mean, think about it. You're all experts in what you do in every field and where you and curate. Why? Because the synergies of the travels of where we got there is we asked. We said, you know, we're here. How do I make myself better? And so in closing, I like to say is that everyone here, we have the opportunity now to join any vertical that's out there, which is any industry, to find out why, what's about space, having all the you know astronauts on one podcast, let's say, or what are we doing in healthcare? What are we doing? What how we deal with stocks? Or what's an NFT? Or what's you know what's the background of of how do we repair our home? How do we better outfit where we live and and how do we deal with technology? Um, those things we can self-train to some degree by just asking, how do I do this? And we're not at, we're not doing enough ask and the resources, the collaboration. Um, and then also I love, love, love the reflective side that Tasha talked about because did I, how do I look at myself? And one of the things that was so powerful in the last six months I heard is what do you want your tombstone to say about you? Mm-hmm. And I was just like, whoa, wait a second. You know, we're going way too far, but I'm thinking, you're right. How do we reflect on what we've done in our life and how we've helped others or help, how do we sleep with ourselves at night? Yeah, you I know, mean, you I, oh, sorry, Chitra. I just got to say the ask, Desiree, is so critical. That's such a great point. I, I spoke at many, many different engagements, large groups of people. And don't you always love when someone has a well thought out question that they bring to the table? It just makes you feel like, oh, you were listening or engaged. You know, it's great. So people get afraid to ask the question, but as speakers, we're like, we love the questions. Bring the questions, you know? So I thought, perfect point, Desiree. Perfect point. Yeah. The same. It's a beautiful device to ask oneself what I can be, ask your manager what he or she thinks what I can be. So it's such a powerful technique and uh, uh, regrettably we don't use it that much. And uh, that's what we are, we, this, this whole uh, leadership principle is all about uh, uh, encouraging and uh, coaching the women to uh, do that. So, so we talked about growth in order to, that, that's about visioning, envisioning, right? So do you have some strategies, tips to offer? Uh, because we don't want to, today to define us. So all of us have dreams, a vision. So do you use vision boards? I've talked, I mean, I've heard about that. Any, any techniques and tips to think about oneself, what, is, what the future is going to be and make it so powerful that you're every day, you're waking up motivated by that. So I actually um, use um, this, you know, um, every day. And this is something our CEO, Gino Blafari, actually taught me because I didn't really do this before. As much as people say, and you know, I, I would do it, but this is actually, I, I write down what I want to accomplish or, you know, and then, you know, what am I grateful for and what, who made me smile yesterday? So you're thinking about, positive and then what here are my goals there and I write them over and over again so where do I want to be and so that's something I do I do believe in the vision board I've always believed in the vision board and you know what's so weird when I was in my or like right out of college I met Oprah Winfrey and she was brand I mean she was new and I mean she was you know very big and her her show was very popular but it wasn't as you know she wasn't the billionaire she is today and I remember her talking about writing your things so I did well about a a year ago I went through and I kept it in my wall you know and I looked at it and guys I can tell you like 60 percent of the things that I had written down had come to fruition. I had, you know, visualized them. And so I do believe, so a vision board for me, you know, is a big deal. So I do write things down, also um, do a vision board. And I do believe in that. So just envisioning where you want to be, where you see yourself, you know, I, I just, that you're calling out to the universe. So I'm one of those people that does, and a lot of realtors are like that. You, you'll hear, you know, that's part of our 
technique or our process. And I think it's really important. But Tasha, your comment about when you're hired, that's what people see you as. And that is so true. It, it doesn't matter what, you know, you can never, it's like your own children. You can't see them as the, you know, my daughter is leading. And I'm like, my daughter is like, uh, and I, I, I know she's great and I know all that, but I, I can't even imagine that she's doing this, right? Because I see her as my little girl and my son as well. So those are such, such true things uh, as we look at people. So all those things really make uh, us preparing for the future because it does come um, uh, to, to uh, come to true, in my opinion, in my experience, the things that you envision or the, it's like what you focus on expands what you focus on, the positive, what you focus on expands, but the negative is what you focus on also expands. If you think in negative, that's what's going to happen to you. If you think positive, that's what's going to happen to you. So I love it. Mm -hmm. That's another good technique. Anyone yeah. else does this? I, yeah. I, I love the goal setting. I was going to say the same thing, Teresa. I love that book you have, by the way, that looked great, but um, goal setting in general, going back to, I think Tasha brought it up as well. It, it's critical. It, it absolutely gives you a a way to see a path and you start to build that path, you know? And um, I think it's one of the most important things, both on the financial side we were talking about, the career side, and even the family side, right? Plan, being able to plan comes from having a goal. If you don't have a goal, you can't make a plan. So um, I think that's critical. And then I, I wanna throw something else into you. I just wanna say, you know, um, at, at some point as well, as you're achieving things along the way, giving back to your community is so important. And I think it's a, a piece that people forget about along the path that we get so absorbed with ourselves. It's really not just about us. It's about helping others along the way. So I just want to encourage people too, if you're listening, you know, the faith side, the, um, the community side are pieces that you can't forget as you prepare for the future. How are you going to, you know, keep your faith? How are you going to help others along the way? Those are important pieces too. Yeah. Kelly, and I was going to tell that when we uh, when we wrote up the principles, uh, prepare the uh, prepare for the future and the next one, where all my contributions where I was talking about. So that's why we don't say prepare for your future. We say prepare for the future. It's the future of everyone, not just prepare for your future, my future. It's everyone's future, the humanities, the worlds, the, the earths and so on. So I was so, uh, we were very intent on when Desiree and I were wordsmithing it, we were intent on not making it that, you know, parochial. Uh, so. Uh, can I also say, Kelly, I, you know what? And one thing too, even when you're giving back to the community, think about the following because there are times in our career roles where we don't get the chance to ex show our leadership skills because like you said you know Tasha you you may not be seen in that light but even giving back volunteering you are able to you know develop those skill sets that you might not have a chance to develop within a company so that's another way because you're also developing yourself and there's nothing more beautiful than giving back. That is the number one thing they say that creates happiness in this world is, is content. And when you give back, that is what people say is the best feeling and the feeling of gratitude that they get when they're able to give to others. Absolutely. Any stories uh, for you? I was, gonna, I, was, yeah. I was gonna mention um, something that as, as you were speaking, Teresa, that I thought of, um, giving back for sure. I mean, there's so many studies that um, point to the people that sort of donate time um, to causes that are important to them are the most fulfilled and the happiest. Um, so I think, you know, I'm, I try my hardest to weave that into my life too. The other thing that I've been less good at in my career, but I'm trying to really push myself to do um, that like next level thinking is, um, you know, I'm pretty good at goal setting, you know, and last few years I've been better at than previous years, again, shifting from that in-moment firefighting to like that more strategic goal setting phase of working through that. Um, now my mind's shifting more to like, what characteristics do I want to hone in myself? Like, what are the traits that I most admire that I see my peers or, you know, my manager, for example, who Desiree knows, what are the things that make them really special in their role? And how can I surround myself with people that um, will provide me with inspiration to do the same. So 
you know, in some ways I've become like a really a student of leadership and just, yeah, I guess leadership. And so, you know, for example, um, Craig Walker, who's my manager, is the most positive person I've ever met. There is not a negative thought that appears in his brain. I swear, I don't know how it happens. Like I can present him with the most negative situation and he will find a silver lining and then come up with reasons why it's actually a blessing. So he's really, really good at that. And I have realized that I'm, that's not my gift. So I am trying really hard to, whenever my mind goes negative, like, you know, create that neuro pathway that corrects my thinking on something, right? So I'm trying to hone in on characteristics that I admire that are most highly correlated with the most successful people that I know and, and force myself to like generate that in myself, even if it's not the most natural thing. So gratitude, I can be grateful in a whole bunch of situations, but, but sometimes when things get seem really stressful, I go negative and I, and I go like, how am I going to get out of this? And oh gosh, this is scary or whatever. Instead of looking for the blessing and trying to think about the positives of that situation, that change switches like in the neural pathways, it has an impact. I know it does. <laughs> Nothing it does. More, um, more truer than that, right? Uh, Tasha, optimism, because we can envision what we want to be. But uh, as we begin to execute, as we begin to plan and do things, we may come across obstacles and only pop optimism is the one only thing that keeps us going. So, yeah, when I read about leaders uh, who scare their employees and, uh, you know, if, tough leaders, I always wonder <laughs> how do they how do they motivate their employees in a very positive way? that yes, there are going to be, it's not going to be a bed of roses. We are going to find obstacles, but we can find that thread of light, thread of optimism into it so that we can march forward. So that's so true. So Desiree, yeah. Mm, well, I, I you are the most, one of the most optimistic, energetic people. We <laughs> no, no, I, I have to third it, fourth it, fifth it uh, about Craig, about uh, uh, um, Craig Walker, Tasha's um, manager. Um, he you know, every commitment that he makes or says or does, um, it's just like, oh my gosh. And to have the scalability of this company, you said you're hiring what, 230 people in the next three months. I mean, that's unbelievable. Um, you know, a quarter of the company times and times again. And he is the most caring. I mean, I, my conversation, I mean, I am stuttering here because it's so true. He's a guy and here we're supposed to be talking about women and helping and all that kind of stuff. But the man, he has his ability to just see the silver lining in so many layers that he, it's unbelievable. You feel like you just found your best friend who's going to fulfill what he said he's gonna do and he does it in such elegance. I gotta just say it from a personal human being element, unbelievable. Um, so yeah, oh, it does. I'll fly down and I'll, I'll see you. We're going to do this and this and this and this and this just out of the middle of everything, you know, middle of vacation and, and yeah, let's just clear it out and we're going to do it. And I'm just like, okay, like, oh. so anyway, um, to me, to answer the question, I would like to take it back a little bit on how can it help us as the struggles that I personally have gone through and a lot of us have gone through in, um, and amplify what I talked about before is the more we're prepared the we can help save a life like for example when my son went got leukemia i got to know every single thing about that doctor surrounded about leaders surrounded about people who make me more positive like tasha talked about how i can make myself better informed to help mitigate and and get through to the positive light of the end goal which is life right and how we can better that sustainability and help our our quality of life and I believe that in our workforce, I believe that in our own personal lives and, our, and in how we can help educate others and share our experiences on what we went through. And I think that's the whole purpose of this whole council is to take our combined experiences or combined journeys or combined leadership to really amplify each other, to grow the synergies like we do at our conferences, we do every month to make it to where we can help each other go, I didn't think of that. Okay, this is cool. And we can help each other make each other better. And that's the power. And, and to Tasha's point, I am not, I'm bubbly. Yeah. And I have so much energy. But at the end of the day, I, it's really hard for me to let go of the past of certain things that it weighs me down. And my focus point for my continued growth is to let it go. Think about the future. 
and work on the future because what's the past you can't change it's it's done and gone and as erica right now and is would always say it's the past move on and and get with the intensity of new life and so that's one thing as a leader i really want to amplify is is that don't hang on what happened to you in the past and and, and move past the negativity of people that have uh, had had bad consequences because things do change and we have to embrace uh, the good of everyone well, I think it's kind of funny too. One way to feel better is to read history. We're so much better today than we were 50 or 100 years ago. Right? I sometimes think about how did the pioneer women even come across, you know, the the plains or whatever. I can't even imagine it. So, you want to really feel a lot better. Sometimes read a little history, you'll feel really good about where you're at today and you can move forward. Well, I'm preparing for the future also. Sometimes the future may not turn out to be what you might have envisioned. So, Teresa, that's, um, uh, Kelly, you mentioned resilience. But that's where my head went because often we, uh, we wish, we desire, we dream about the future to be a certain way. And when we are there, it, it, is not, it doesn't turn out to be what we wanted it to be. And uh, part of coping up with that, in that scenario is resilience and as well as being openness. So I would like to hear about in your journey where you might have thought, you, you know, you wanted to go this way and you when we went there, it didn't turn out to be what you wanted and how you pivoted. How did you uh, uh, adapt yourself? Um, so I would love to hear about uh, some. Uh, yeah, you know, um, I think that happens a lot, Chitra. And, you know, resilience, People would always ask me, what's the number one quality you're looking for in a salesperson today versus 20 years ago? It's resilience because you have to be able to get over the things that happen, get past those obstacles and be able to take that bad situation and turn it into something positive. So uh, for example, when I joined UPS again, uh, this is a long time ago, <laughs> there, there was no hiring from outside. I was one of the only ones. I was a female as well, coming to a very male dominated company. And one of the things um, I had a ton of operations experience, not a lot of sales experience, but some, and uh, they said I needed more operations. And I was like, no, I don't need that. <laughs> Yes, you do. So they put me into running a center, you know, full of drivers. And these were union drivers. And, and you know, you're the only female. And it was an interesting experience. I thought to myself, this is absolutely crazy. I do not need this. Why am I, why are you doing this? The best thing I ever did. It was the best thing I ever did because it allowed me to understand the company from the ground floor up. And that's where I did so much learning again, right? If you keep your mind open, mm -hmm. you can stay very resilient because you know, I'm just going to learn. I'm going to learn from this person. I'm going to learn about this. Um, and and if, if you don't, that if you aren't resilient and you can't stick with it, um, you'll never know where that path takes you. Well, where that path took me was getting promoted to director of sales and then to a VP of sales and running the whole country and, you know, all kinds of things. So, I mean, you've got to be willing to say, okay, there's something I'm going to learn here. There's something I can learn here. And even sometimes you get a bad boss, you can learn how to not be a bad boss, right? <laughs> you can learn the things you never want to do as a boss. So I always say, you know, um, resilience and, you know, stick it out, stay in there and learn something. And then you'll find another path to wherever it is you want to go. Who wants to go next? It's growth and comfort don't go together. Tying back to growth again. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> <a> Beautiful. <laughs> Good summary. Good summary. So anyone, uh, anyone to offer some life experiences? Uh, well, I think perseverance too, with that resilience too, I think it's really important that you continue, even when it's sometimes you, you know, you're told that maybe you're not the right person for this opportunity, or maybe you doubt yourself. It's just to persevere and continue to fight. And, and that's part of preparing for the future, right? Especially if you have, you've driven, to a certain goal or you see yourself in a position or um, you know somewhere that maybe someone else doesn't and that happens quite a bit and I, I have to tell you from a personal perspective that happened to me quite a bit right where I had a certain goal in mind I wanted to be you know to do something and others said well that's really not you're not as good as you think or this is not something you might do well in um, and certainly it was what I wanted to do and there were other people behind me that said yes you can Teresa you should move forward and sometimes your closest people are not always the best you know give it right 
because they don't see you in the light that others do. So I think perseverance is really important and a big part of any great leader that is looking for the future to grow is to always remember. I mean, if you look at, you know, Harry Potter, the, the, um, you know, the, the writer of the hair, I forgot her name now of, of that and Sarah Blakely, who started Spanx and all they had in common was they had a goal. They persevered. They kept going. They kept going, even though people told them no, 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 no. They knew what they wanted and certainly look at them now. So that I think is a big part of what I think is really critical is perseverance and things that happened to me was just to keep going and keep doing until I got it perfected. Very good. You're coming up on the ending time. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to add real quick, Chita, real quick, sorry, for the perfection part, you just mentioned, uh, Teresa, so I have to jump in on that. Um, I always had a fear as a child, believe it or not, I know you're all going to say that I'm crazy, um, of talking. I had a huge fear of getting up in front of stage of talking when I was very young. Um, I would cringe, I would cry, I would go in a corner, there's no way you're going to get me in front of talking because I was so fearful that I could not enunciate it could not you know I did, my vocabulary was poor I could go down the list and I finally had to realize I bring the passion of the heart doesn't matter exactly what it comes out of my mouth the perfection part of me I have to put aside so even today I'll go oh man I said the wrong word or you know we didn't put this right and I have to still remind myself you bring the passion and heart it's okay because people will overlook it and not judge you based on that one word you know we're in cancer culture and all that kind of stuff that's going on so there's a little here and there but i realize they want to see your energy they want to see who you are what makes who you different and it's not about always being perfect and that was the biggest thing and that's one of the reasons i i have still fear but i can get in front of five thousand people i can get onto it i still have a fear of talking one-to-one -one, believe it or not because i'm like look in your eyes oh my gosh <laughs> but i have to go it's okay because the more you do it, the better you get at it. So I want to make sure everyone knows, get over your fears and just work at what your fears are. You can get better. Hey, there are three Ps, passion, planning, Tasha, and perseverance. Yeah. Is, they are needed for preparing for the future. So thank you again, fellow NDLC members for giving this time. And uh, we'll be back again next month. Yes. So, so let me go ahead. So thank you. Thank you very much. Did, Tasha, you didn't get to speak. Did you want to add something real quick? No, uh, you know, I, the one thing that I'll just my last little management training nugget that I got, I'm fresh off this and I'm passionate about it. One of the three P's is that I think many of us, maybe especially women, I know this too well, is that when someone sort of tells us something that we perceive as negative, like maybe there's some negative feedback in what we produced or something about the way we did something. Too often we attach it to like our self-esteem and us as a person. I think it's so important for personal growth and future planning to say that feedback or that, that challenge was is specific to that activity. It is not representative of my potential or my or my future, what the future holds for me. So just like in summary, I think it's really important to detach sort of self-value from maybe like some in-moment coaching or some temporary setbacks. Like, you know, all of those things are situational and are basically can be changed. So I love it. That's a great way to end on the subject. Would you like to make a comment, Tita, real quick before I close it out? No, what a fantastic engagement uh, some summary that Tasha had. So going back to, we started with growth and uh, we, we, we are adaptable to whatever the future comes before as a resilience, as a, as a, as a great uh, uh, trait. So okay. thanks again. And uh, thank you, Desiree, for giving us this opportunity to come together. Thank you, Chitra. And, you know, I call her mother, uh, Chitra, uh, Mother Teresa of AI, you know, 35 years in the AI sp uh, uh, space. I mean, unbelievable, your vision and such a perfect ending to it. So um, I just want to give everyone the announcement that um, next week on the 12th, we're going to have the delegates do the same topic. Uh, those are the, you know, the business owners and the, and the, the working on the set. Um, and what it is to leadership in their uh, core for the principle for prepare for the future. Um, and then next month, we're going to have on August, uh, excuse me, September 2nd um, is going to be um, lead by example. Inclusion isn't enough. Press for parity and strive for excellence in everything. 
So thank you. And again, uh, Chicha is going to be leading that one. So I want to thank everyone for their time and energy. Uh, most importantly, the health everyone take care and to all our extended NDLC members that couldn't join us today. Um, and everyone loves and hugs and everything that goes on. And we'll see you. And remember everyone, today, today for the entire month is prepare for the future. So make sure you hashtag it and find us and reach out with anything you'd like to talk to us about. So thank you again, everyone. And we'll talk to you and see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.